You're the best there ever was. <coughs> Good evening and welcome back to Pastoral Talks. Of course, I'll be your host this evening. I'm Dr. Ken. With me as always is Dr. Earl. And of course, we our special guest is Pastor Vicki, and I'm so pleased that she joined us tonight. I want to say one thing before we start. I want to talk about fear and worry, because it's calling God a liar if we fear and worry. Let me give you a thought real quick. In Job 7, 18, God tests every moment, not just some moments, not most moments, but every moment, so I'll show you why. Test can mean exam. Now watch this. God is, is scrutinizing every moment of our lives because He's our Father to take the responsibility to love us and care for us very seriously. So he wants to make sure we're confident in everything that he has begun a good work in us and will complete it into the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.16. So when we will give us a reward. Revelations 22.12. Did you hear that? There's a reward. And obviously it says in Mark 10.30, there's a hundred times the reward if we will do what Jesus tells us to do. So let us begin. I'll start with Dr. Earl. Philippians 4, 6, don't worry about anything. Boy, that's hard to do. Don't worry. Are you kidding? I've got all these bills. I'm struggling at the office. How am I going to pay for the kids to go to college? You know, it seems like all these years I've been married, what happened? We're so busy. We never spend time together. What do I do? The fear, worry, anxiety, questions. We question God and his goodness his care for us. So if we're not trusting God, how can we even trust ourselves? That's when we start really worrying. God tests our faith. Adam and Eve tested and every human uh, sense has been tested. So watch this, Dr. Earl, to you. As we cope with tests, we need to start stir up our faith. That's 2 Timothy 1 6. Stir yourself up and start believing. Exercise that gift of faith that God gave us at the beginning. Your thought, Dr. Well, you know what? I'm glad that every surgeon or every doctor or every airline pilot has gone through a lot of tests. Mm. Because you know what? Tests That's are good. a gauge of where you're really at. And you know what? Mm -hmm. I want them to go through lots of tests because I want that those tests help them to know where they're really at. And so God gives us these tests to help us where we're at with our unbelief, where we're at with mm. our faith, where we're at That's with good. what we believe. And, and here's the thing. Nobody likes a test, but the tests really tell you where you're at. The other part of that is, is God is so patient and he is, time is on his side. He's so patient because he goes, if you fail it the first time, I'm going to let you take it again. And I'm going to let you take it again. <laughs> And I'm going to let That's you good. take it again and again That's and again really until you pass. And the, one of the problems is we, we, look at, we look at the trials from our perspective instead of testing God and saying, God, give me your perspective and your timing. And you know what? Look at Saul back in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. He turned around and he made the sacrifice because he was fearful and he didn't know what to do and he didn't wait on God. He didn't pray and he didn't wait for Samuel to come and do the sacrifice. And he got out of God's timing. He didn't wait. He wasn't patient. And now all of a sudden he then makes a sacrifice mm -hmm. and all of a sudden he just brings all this negativity on him. He then loses his kingship because he wasn't obedient to God. Mm -hmm. God wants obedience more than sacrifice. And he wants, he wants you to be able to be patient, to wait on him till he tells you what to do, till he tells you what's going on. And people panic. Mm -hmm. The enemy's sitting there stirring everything up, so we panic. We've all done it. Where we panic, we do it our way, take it under our control, do everything. And then as we now are in charge, we're now doing it. We just fall right into the enemy, and now we're going to be anxious. Now we're going to be sorrowful. Well, that's really now good. we're going to be guilty. Now we're going through all that, and the enemy just keeps it on us. 
well said that that is deep way to go dr all motivation for such legislation was god's concern for the poor and that's where i want to start with pastor vicky god listens to the cry of the needy exodus twenty two twenty seven and bless of those who he's considered them which is deuteronomy twenty four thirteen twenty four and nineteen interesting god bases this position on his relationship with his people because he's their god leviticus twenty three twenty two you deal with a lot of the poor the needy you go out and minister to them every week i've heard signs and wonders i've heard so many testimonies about your can you share some of the people inspired them wow i just um i really think that's the heart of god is to caring for the poor and it's so important and, and mm -hmm. poor doesn't always necessarily mean economically that's good you know it could be someone that um, is very wealthy financially but yet poor in spirit that's good and, um, so as far as like going out to the food pantry absolutely am committed to go love to go out there and serve and love the goal is always love every single time i go i'm not going to see a sign and wonder i'm not going to see a miracle but the motivation must be love as as i go out each and every time and i go in as a daughter i go in as a daughter of the king reminding myself of my identity in christ that he's with me that's good. He's for me and that I, I you know that's the motivation and i'm willing to give away freely the love of god that he's given me then just watch to see um, there's been so many different testimonies that have happened um, of depression and uh, suicidal thoughts uh, anxiety or whatever it may be but always what i love to do is when i pray for people just to release just an encounter just the presence of the living god in that moment and whatever it is that they're experiencing whatever illness whatever affliction i'm never concerned or or fearful that what they have um, it's going to come on me because i absolutely am covered by the blood of jesus That's good. i come in wearing the armor of god and it's very important as we're doing ministry and as i leave that place i'm washed with the blood of jesus and there's no retaliation from the enemy over my family or over anything else but just to release the presence of god and, and for that person to have an encounter they may forget about their let's say fractured ankle or they may forget about uh, maybe some anxiety that they were experiencing but they won't forget the encounter that they had with god as they are open to receive God's touch. Because, you know, I would never pray for someone and force prayer on them if they didn't want that. It's so important to be honoring when you're ministering in a, in a setting like that and always ask the question, would you like for me to pray for you? Would you like to encounter God? And it's completely their decision. I would never force myself on someone. Well said. I'm going to take Dr. Earl a little bit deeper to inspire you. Now watch this. We're going to talk about Naaman. Where is he? Remember the king of those days. Elijah was the ruling prophet, if you will. In those days, uh, Elijah had been gone on to do, supposedly to heaven. That's a whole different preaching. I won't even get that. But Elijah's there taking over the mantle of Elijah. And the king says, I've heard of this person, but where he got this thought was, there's a handmaid from Naaman's wife saying, if you want to be healed from leprosy, I know a prophet. Now watch this. That's what we're talking about Friday. We know a prophet. We know somebody that knows God. We're asking you to come and co-labor with him. We're asking you to come out. Now watch this, and we'll turn to Dr. Earl Luce on this subject. It, it starts out at 2 Kings 4, uh, roughly one through seven somewhere in there but it talks about a jewish handmaid it recommends how many miracles he's done so we uh we notice that the wife agrees yeah i've heard of him too and then the king goes oh it's that guy yeah if you want to go out there i'll give you a, rec a letter of recommendation Naaman had no idea who this was he was desperate you could tell by him physically it was really bad he was starting to lose body parts he was really deteriorating i mean aids is I take leprosy probably a step equal or a little worse than AIDS because you I mean you're literally yeah. deteriorating in front of people so as we look at that and he comes to uh, Elijah's door and the servant answers the door and he says you know I'm the general I've got this big letter from the king blah 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 so he tells Elijah he throws it on the floor doesn't even look at it and says Go dip seven times in the Jordan. And that was the worst 
dirtiest in those days. I don't know about now. I've got friends in the office talking about it's a different story nowadays. But then it was, you know, that's you mean go there. Yeah. So the, the king was so, or the general was so mad. He says, "How dare you? I want to talk to you." He goes, "Oh, this is what the prophet said. Do it or don't." So he's discouraged and ready to walk away. And one of his men says, "Wait a minute. What do you got to lose? So you go. Who cares?" Again, somebody's faith and courage. We have three people. Now watch this. This is for you at all. Why aren't you coming Friday? I can't make it. Really? I'm not going to be there. Why? I've got something to do. Do you? What are you struggling with? Is it financially, emotionally, physically, your relationships? How bad it could it be like the general? He's deteriorating in front of everybody, and he's still doubting. So the, the handmaid, the lowest of the chain, says to his wife, that tells the king, and the king insists, well, you got to go. That guy is somebody, but he won't talk to me. But I'll give you a recommendation. Now watch this. He gets there. He's offended because he won't come out. Who cares? It's the word of the Lord. Who cares? Who says it? That's the point. Psalm 107, 20. And he sent the word and healed them from their destruction. Hear me. This is a word for you tonight. You're struggling. You're not. You're thinking of all these excuses. Why you no, you need to come. Because guess what happens? He went there and did it himself. Can you picture it? One, two. The dirtiest one you've ever seen. Nothing's happening. Five. Six. He should have stopped. He seven. Wanted, he wanted to stop and go away. Yeah. Seven means completion. Interesting. He's totally healed. Amen. So now he wants to come back and lay all the riches on the prophet. And the prophet goes, no, my God is my supplier. He supplies all my needs. I don't need anything. Thank you. God bless you. And lets him go. So the man of God, or the general says, okay, I'm blessed. Thank you. Throws all this. And he starts to go away. This is where I want to bring Dr. Erlen. Then the servant says, well, wait a minute. I have to go somewhere. I'll be back. And of course, you know what the prophet was thinking. He runs out and goes, oh, my master changed my mind. He wants it all. What happens, Dr. Erlen? Well, he, he didn't take all of what he did. He, he just got a part of it. So he, he asked name, a name in or a name in service. Yeah. They gave him, and I don't remember the exact amount. It wasn't everything but part of it. Mm -hmm. And so he took it in secret. And he took it and then brought it back, did not tell Elisha about it at all. But Elisha, being the prophet, being the man of God, then knows because God exposes it. And so then he exposes him and says, did you take that? We weren't supposed, we said no, we weren't supposed to take that. So he ended up getting the leprosy. Oh. And so, in other words. Well, let me just, I'm not interrupting, but I want you to really get us on track here. If now why is is this happening to you? Is there something secretly you're doing? How did you get financially strapped? Were you tithing? Hear me. Are you storing your money? Are you living above your means or below? Are you paying yourself second? Tithe first, pay yourself second. Why? It's in the Bible. We have to save for a rainy day. We don't know when God will increase, but He will. If you're tithing, it's guaranteed. So, also those tie or that secret savings is also for an offering that God has lent you to be, because you don't have enough money to get what you really need. But if you will sow it, what's our biggest commodity? People. So, are we hiding in sin? What have we really said to our spouse? Is that why she left? Or the kids? Are you really managing them? Or are you criticizing? Are you encouraging or downgrading them? Are you believing in them or discouraging everything they ever thought of? Or here, let's go the other way. And our health. Have we ate chocolate cake all of our life and not exercised? Or there's no such thing as controlling ourselves eating healthy food? Is that how we got there? And we wonder what happened to God? Well, I don't think God's the problem. I think we are. We're not controlling ourselves. One of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So, Dr. will help us. However we got there, now we need help. Now we're calling on God after we messed it all up. How do we get back? Well, I, I want to I say something about stewardship, right? Because that's really what you hit on. Yes. Is God is calling us to be stewards. That's it. Be stewards of our money, stewards of our time, steward of all the resources he's given us. I mean, Jesus Help did us. the parables of the talents. And uh -huh. he did parables about a lot of different things that we need to be good managers of what we have. What we have. So you know what? Your children... You're a steward of your children. You need to be good managers of them. You need to understand they're God's children, 
but he gives you those as being good stewards of your children. So train them in the way he should go, and he will not depart from that. Same thing with your finances. You know, are you are you trying to compete with the Joneses? Are you keeping up with the Joneses? Keeping up with the world? That's or good. Are you keeping your eyes focused on God? And what is He telling you to do? Mm-hmm. You know, if God's saying, buy a Rolls Royce, and He's telling you to, because there's some reason you don't know about this, well, then that's fine. But you know what? That's pretty rare. Most of the time, we want something better, or we want this because of our image, because of what we want. And Satan just feeds that because he wants us in financial trouble. He wants us to be prideful. He wants us to do things our way. But you know what? God wants to give you great things. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to do well. He wants you to do well. He wants your kids to do well. He wants your marriage to do well. He wants your business to do well. He wants you to go to work and be a great example to your boss. He doesn't want you to be lazy at work. He wants you to work hard, do a good job, you know, in everything you do. Why? When you're working, do it all to be glorifying God, working to God, not to man, doing everything with your eyes focused on Him, knowing the Word, knowing that you're living by the Word, by the word of the Holy Spirit guiding us so that we are glorifying God and be constantly putting people back to God with not just what we say, but in our actions. They see it, and they see us doing well, and they see us honoring God and then doing well in our marriage and our kids and different things. That then makes them want to seek after God. Good word. Now, you see that thing on the screen? That's your contract, the saying, I'm coming Friday. Whatever it says, it doesn't matter. I believe that supernaturally on the screen to believe that you need to sign that mentally, that you're coming Friday for your breakthrough. Pastor, to you, the Lord was made poor so we could be rich. Notice how he does this. He brings us low. Why not the torturous? So he can raise us back up. Psalm says, the poor call on the Lord for help. Psalms 34, 6, 70, and 5, 109, 26, and 22. Knowing that he's heard the cry, Psalm 69, 33, then he's our provider, Psalms 68, 10. So he rescues us, Psalm 65, 10. So this is proof of fact. We're satisfied then, Psalm 62, or I'm sorry, 32, 15. All scripturally done. Now, why is that? We have to have belief. What is belief? The count of facts. Hear me. Faith is complete with our belief. But we have a measure of faith. We already found this out. We just have a measure of faith of what God gives us. It's up to him. It's a gift. We can't decide what it does. doesn't matter. Jesus said to the disciples, they said, can you play for our faith? Because you don't need it. See, faith of a mustard seed. That's all we need. That's right. So we use his names, uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 9 and 10. Every knee has to bow. So pastor to you, if every knee has to bow and he hears our cry, he promised he'd satisfy us, then how, why are we struggling and why are we still worrying? You know, I think sometimes, you know, anything in heaven, there's no illness, That's it. depression, That's it. disease, anxiety, fear in heaven. And, and I think that's what happens is we just end up, unfortunately, buying into the lies of the enemy. And that's, that's what's so important about knowing the word and, and understanding the good shepherd and what he says and how he speaks. Because the lies are going to come. That's it. And, and we're not immune to that. Each one of us understand as we're walking this out and this journey that we're mm-hmm. in and, and, and now walking out our, our um, salvation. That's absolutely, good. those darts are going to come. So it's... You know, we definitely want to make certain that we never appear to be as if we're better than you or there's any shame or guilt for where you are. I mean, I've been to the food pantry myself when I was a single mom, and I know what it's like to go on that line and accept food and aid. I understand what that's like. I, I was, as a teenager, on the streets as a runaway and on drugs and, and just into a complete mess of being lost. But what I can also say at the same time, too, is whatever the circumstances, I have learned to be content in every circumstance, whether I have much or little, because inside is the peace of God. Inside, Jesus lives inside of me, so it's not dependent on my circumstance. 
how big my house is. It's got to be 10 bedrooms for me to be happy. I have to be making you know, above six figures in order to be content or have peace or feel value in what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's absolutely a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And he is our comforter. He is our comforter. He is our comforter. And wherever you're at, whatever you're experiencing, know him. Allow him just to touch you. If it's comfort wow. you need, let him minister to you tonight. Wow, wow, let him wow. touch you right now where you are, wherever that is, because he can minister to you like nothing can. Nothing of this world can satisfy you like his love and his affection and his kindness and his mercy and his absolute grace on your life. And, and I think that's just it. People, unfortunately, don't understand the truth and understand the lies that come at them and be able to recognize, that's wait, powerful. that's not my father. That's not, that's not God that's speaking to me. God would never say that to me. And to be able to reject that lie in Jesus' name and understand truth. Powerful. I want to quote one thing real quick before we continue, and I'll bring you back to Dr. L. Is from the penthouse, or from the prison to the penthouse, it took one word from the Pharaoh or the king. Isn't that our king? One word. Yeah. You go from prison, bring him, yeah. come out. And he says this, because of God's grace. Uh, God showed you these things, so you must be the wisest man. I put you in charge of the country. The people will obey your commands. I will be the only one more powerful than you. I'll make you governor. In other words, he says, I'll ordain you. Hear me. So many people are saying, well, how do I get ordained as a pastor or a prophet? It doesn't matter. God will ordain you. That's what the Pharaoh or we're seeing this is a shadow or a metaphor that the king, Jesus, ordained you or Joseph in this case. Or have you been in prison? Are you struggling that now? How do you know if you don't come Friday that God won't show up? Because you've been praying, you've been going to church? Really? Are you really believing? Or is it your unbelief? I got faith. Of course, we all have a measure of faith. But where's your belief? Are you not quite believing the contents of the word? Or are you just short on what he's saying? Do we really, really believe? That's the case. So it doesn't take a big belief. It's, I mean, faith. It's like Jesus said, faith of mustard seed. Isn't it interesting how it grows, though? It, we, it won't grow per se. We can develop it, and we have a measure of faith. But I believe it's the unbelief that we always are working on. If we will truly believe in what it said, that's Amen. what we've done. So, Dr. Earl, help us. We're closing out right now. We have three minutes left. Pray for us. Help us understand what we need to know to get us here. Okay. I want to say one thing, and then I'm going to pray. So, Joseph, was in, he was in prison almost 12 years. He could have given up with doubt right away, yes, but right. he had to persevere through. That's so right. that word took a minute, but in reality, it took 12 years of that seed having Powerful to grow before That's right. it was ready to be, good word. be pulled up. And That's so, really so good. many times with us, we, we want to harvest the fruit in a short period of time. So, mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, just touch them. Help them to understand that obedience is one of the keys that keeping their eyes on you, just like with Joseph, it took 12 years. Help them to understand where they're at in the process so they don't take their eyes off of you, so they don't listen to the lies of the enemy. They persevere through, focus on you, knowing that you have a good plan, even though that plan might be not, won't be what they might think it is, just like Joseph didn't know, but he trusted. He trusted, kept his eyes focused on you, knew you were good, and then you had a great plan. So just help them with their unbelief. Touch them. Let them have an encounter with you. I just pray that they'll have hope to persevere through and to just keep focusing on you, seeking after you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I just want to encourage you to call that number, 714 299-6098. Call us now. We'll give you directions. I want to close with this last thought. I believe, as it says in Acts 2-2, they asked for the Holy Spirit. It came in them. Jesus promised that we'll ask and believe in him. The Holy Spirit will come in us. And that's what starts us in our faith walk. That's what encourages us. That's what prompts us, corrects us, 
and, and cheers us on. But I want to give you a different step. If you'll come for me, I'll show you Luke 3, 22. It says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. That was Jesus in the form of a dove. Not an actual dove, it looked like one. But that's what ministers, you are in the Holy Spirit, in you will rest on you for others. It's the life that Dr. Earl talked about. That's what you need, others. If you put your faith in others, that's what you need to know. Is uh, It says the biggest servant is the greatest leader, uh, Matthew 23, 11. So I'm encouraging you, serve others. The people that you serve is going to be your commodity that's going to help you with the breakthrough that you need. Of course, it's all illustrated by God. God starts in you. Now, shine. Let his glory shine out to you. Until next week, I'm Dr. Ken, of course. The great Dr. Earl will be back with me soon. Of course, with, along with Pastor Vicki. We thank you so much for walking. We'll see you next week. God bless us.